Welcome back, I'm That Chemist. In today's video, we have a story where somebody tears up a jewel in their chemistry lab. One day in undergrad organic lab, we were doing an epoxidation of paramethoxypropenyl benzene. We'll call it MPB, just your standard MCPBA and reagent in DCM. Reflux for a while at 100 degrees Celsius, yada yada. The key here is that the reaction was to take place in DCM. Now, MPB is a liquid at room temperature, so naturally somebody forgot the solvent. Within the span of seconds, a classmate with a round bottom full of MPB pours a wayboat full of MCPBA into the round bottom and stared at it blankly as the thing began violently frothing and off-gassing some kind of angry-looking fumes. Our OCHEM professor saw it pretty fast, thankfully, and grabbed the rapidly heating round bottom and rolled it into the fume hood like a grenade and shut the thing before shooing everyone into the hallway. We spent around an hour in the hall debating what kind of gas it was, because some of the nearby students got a pretty good lungful of it and said it was super acrid and felt like flaming pool chlorine. We suspect it may have been chlorine that somehow popped off the MCPBA under heat, but honestly, boiling peroxy acid sounds like it'd make all kinds of weird crap, so I've got no clue. Next up, I was doing an analytical chem lab where we were given a pack of jewel pods, a pair of pliers, and were told to determine the percent by weight of nicotine and quinoline in a pod. We were warned a fair bit beforehand that nicotine has a reputation of absorbing through skin, and as such, we were given some thicker gloves than the normal black nitrile ones. I went to the fume hood and started trying to crack open my pod, and foreseeably, the pod literally cracked open, spilling the majority of its contents all over my gloves. There was still enough to snag a sample, since we only needed a few microliters, so I decided to just make my samples in standard solutions, then change gloves afterwards. Now, when you're dealing with chemicals that have a reputation of crossing the skin barrier, I'd highly recommend that you respect them. By the time I had gotten my samples and was back at my bench, a pretty significant amount of the vape goo had apparently been able to absorb through my skin, despite the thicker gloves. For the rest of the lab, I was tweaking super hard, having accidentally ingested probably somewhere near a quarter of a jewel pod all at once, given that over three quarters of it went on my gloves. We were watching our professor explain the brand new Auto GC machine that they got with a literal robot arm that manipulates the tray of samples, and I was kind of sitting there, vibrating in the corner, trying not to look like I had just smoked a bunch of meth. Both are big reasons why I do computational now. I've actually worked with nicotine before, and not in the way that you might expect. During my research, I was looking at methylating a series of tertiary amines. One such tertiary amine that we explored was nicotine, as it resembled one of our compounds that performed really well in our experiments. And methylprolidine was what we use normally, and nicotine has this group within it. Fortunately, I looked into the safety ahead of time, and I also saw that the skin absorption could be a major issue. Unfortunately, the chemistry didn't work very well. But fortunately, I was able to include that the nicotine didn't work in the paper that we published. Nicotine is a really potent compound, so if you're working with concentrated solutions of it, it's important to make sure that you don't get any on your skin. Otherwise, it could be absorbed, and you could potentially have a nicotine overdose if you're working with really concentrated solutions. I worked at a pesticide analytics lab once, like testing random groceries for traces of pesticides. One day, we got a delivery of dry ice for God knows which procedure. The person who had accepted that delivery thought it was a good idea to put it into our big walk-in freezer. Ice into the freezer. Not that far off, right? Fast forward a few hours. Person walks into said freezer, takes two breaths, drops on the spot. Luckily, another person was following on foot and pulled dropped person out of the freezer by the feet. The person that had put the CO2 in the freezer got fired and was charged for causing involuntary bodily harm. This is definitely the yikes wordy of this compilation, as cryogenic liquids and cryogenic solids will release gas which can displace the air in a room. In this case, the CO2 displaced the air in the room and that caused the person to suffocate and collapse. It's appropriate to have detectors in place so that you can know if any hazardous gases are present so that you don't get asphyxiated. Because dying from a bunch of gas that could suffocate you would really blow. The moral of the story is don't put solidified CO2 into hermetically sealed spaces, or you might get a not-so-pleasant appointment at the court for involuntarily causing bodily harm or manslaughter. Worst case, you die. First, I am not a chemist. I had an internship at a company who builds pumps for odorization of natural gas. It's done with a chemical pumped into a gas pipeline, so you can smell the gas if there's a leak. Now to my story. I worked on one job there, and the guy I worked with said to me, if you can get something on your clothes, the smell takes a while to go away. Naturally, I got some of this stuff on my work clothes. I forgot about it and went to a gas station to buy cigarettes. And I almost triggered an evacuation of the surrounding area because the entire gas station smelled of natural gas and I didn't notice it. Luckily, I was able to clarify quickly, I don't smell much since I was 12 because of a small accident in my chemistry class. Our teacher gave us a sample to smell and you should fan the smell to yourself. And I took a big whiff of it. And now since then, I can't smell so much. 
That's really sad to hear. I haven't ever smelled a chemical that permanently altered my smell, but I know there's some people that are really sensitive to certain smells. There's a lot of cases where universities have been evacuated because someone was working with thiols and somehow that information doesn't get communicated. That just really goes to show how effective the communication at the universities is. If you can smell a signal before someone in your department can tell you, there's definitely an issue with communication going on. Worked with an acylation reagent in the second semester of uni, we were acylating some alcohol groups in cyclodextrins to make ampiphilic cyclodextrins, which would then be used to make nanoparticles because cyclodextrins are very good at complexing with cancer drugs. The reagent we used was hexanoyl chloride, and we had to add it to a solution of pyridine and the naked beta cyclodextrins, and were told to be extremely careful and slow in adding it, but we were not told why. When I added some, I accidentally did it a bit too quickly, and some yellow gas formed on the top and then disappeared. I looked up at my friend, terrified, and saw that he had the same realization. We had just accidentally made some chlorine gas. Fortunately, this was all in a fume hood, so we were fine. Also, thank god we avoided most of the pyridine smell but accidentally making chlorine gas was pretty sketchy for a first-year chemical engineering student. I haven't ever heard of a case where an acyl chloride was able to release chlorine in the form of Cl2. It's possible that cyclodextrins have some strange chemistry that would make this occur, but as far as I know, the conversion of an acyl chloride to chlorine gas isn't a thing that happens. It's possible that something else formed here, like HCl, pyridine, HCl salts, etc. But nonetheless, it still sounds like this person was exposed to something dangerous. And you can also dilute stuff into solutions so that when it's added, it isn't as exothermic. I have a story from one hour ago. I'm a senior in high school, and I'm very interested in chemistry, so I'm always doing reactions at school. One of the things I'm currently working on is synthesizing lanthanide nitrates from oxides, and then heating them up and recording the temperature that they start to decompose at. So for one of the syntheses, I wanted to use nitrogen dioxide so that I could have the anhydrous nitrate. So for this, I decided to first make an ampule of liquid nitrogen dioxide. Let me just say, as a high school student, you have no business making an ampule of nitrogen dioxide. If you haven't seen someone make an ampule of a toxic gas before, you're probably not trained to prepare an ampule of a toxic gas. So long story short, I made about one milliliter of liquid nitrogen dioxide, which was blue from some N2O3 that had formed, and stored it in a 10 milliliter test tube that I had made into an ampule. Then I put it in the freezer, which was located in the corner of the room, 10 to 15 meters opposite the fume hood, just about to be safe. Then I went back to the fume hood to clean up, and about five minutes later, I hear a glass break, and I look behind me, and I see a freshman holding the freezer door open with a concerned look on her face, and a large orange cloud traveling across the classroom towards a senior that was half asleep. So my chemistry teacher then evacuated the classroom, and I luckily already had my respirator hanging around my neck, so I put it on and we opened the windows and turned a fan on. I only had a slight sting in my throat and eyes, and everyone else was fine. Honestly, I wouldn't even work with nitrates at home, let alone nitrogen dioxide, so the fact that you're working with this in a high school lab on your own should be a big red flag about whether or not your teacher is able to adequately supervise this. If you're working with stuff like nitric acid, nitrogen dioxide, and you don't have a supervisor or teacher around, it's probably not a good idea, and it would be a better idea to wait until you can safely carry out those types of experiments. A few years ago, I worked for a company that did electrodeless nickel plating. The coating started after the bath reached a certain temperature. Operating temps were around 175 degrees Fahrenheit, I think. I'm in Alberta, so we basically did all of our work for the oil field, and we had these two long tubes to run the fluid through, so we could do pup joints up to 10 or 12 feet long. The company was fairly young, and the two owners hadn't made up proper procedures or anything like that, besides how to titrate to check the chemical balance, so we knew when we had to add more chemicals. After the plating was thick enough, usually 0.001 inch, we would pull the parts from the regular bath with a crane, and then the tubes would end up being sealed off, which allowed for pressure to build up. The guy that was mainly running this knew about this, but I didn't ask, so I yanked off the hose at the top and got sprayed with a hot solution, and I got a pretty bad burn on my hand. I ended up staying up all night from the pain, and since I took the next day off, the workers' comp claim was a missed time incident, which was pretty bad for them. Nickel is one of those chemicals that most people don't even realize is carcinogenic. You can get nickel allergies, and I wouldn't go anywhere near a hot nickel plating bath. That sounds like something pretty toxic, and a missed time incident is something you definitely want to avoid your supervisor reporting. The owners and everyone else at the time also didn't really realize the hazards of the stuff. Nitric acid was used to clean the nickel plating tank, as it would build up solid nickel on the sides and would release an orange gas. I was the first to figure out that this was nitrogen dioxide and was pretty hazardous. The guy I mentioned before would just hold his breath on the days he cleaned the tank with nitric acid. <sighs> this is terrible. They also didn't provide us with cartridges that worked for ammonia, which we used to balance the pH of the plating solution. 
These are red flags. If there are many near misses and missed near misses, then that is a sign that you have an unsafe workplace. So to preface this, I'm not nuclear certified, nor do I actually work with any sources. I'm an engineer. However, this story involves my friend, who's a nuclear physicist, and his colleague, who's an organic chemist. Anyway, I'm one of five primary engineers on this project, building a nuclear train. I'm responsible for designing the driver interfaces and human elements. My friend, the physicist, we'll call him Jay, and his friend, the chemist, we'll call him Laird, were out on the work floor. Jay was giving Laird the tour of the shop, showing off the trains and RTGs, radioisotope thermoelectric generator. According to everyone in the shop that day, Jay had slipped on a pile of alamite grease, fell backwards into Laird, who fell onto an active and running RTG, knocking it over. I'm shitting bricks. RTG hits the floor, as do Laird and Jay, making an ungodly crash. Luckily, that RTG had its daily inspection right around the corner, and it had already been tested and rated to survive a 20-foot fall without breaching source containment. The RTG had minor dents and scratches. I had nightmares for a week. Laird got cut up a little bit by the radiator fins on the RTG, and Jay was scrubbing alamite from his boots for days on top of several safety protocol updates and new safety briefings every two weeks or so. I have a story fresh from the lab. I wanted to do a reduction of a phosphine precursor with lithium aluminum hydride, using about 10 milligrams of lithium aluminum hydride. So I grabbed a 10 gram bottle of lithium aluminum hydride with about five grams still left in it, as it was an older bottle, and began to weigh it. After having transferred about 150 milligrams of lithium aluminum hydride from the bottle, I hit some kind of crust and scraped to free more material. Then, a 30 centimeter flame shot out of the bottle, which yeeted about two grams of burning lithium aluminum hydride onto the bench. This is horrifying. I quickly managed to douse the flames by covering everything with a generous amount of salt. Salt is effective for putting out organometallic fires, as you have to suffocate the flame. Water will react with LEH. Salt will stop it from reacting further. The fire alarm triggered nonetheless, and the whole building was evacuated. Lessons learned. Always wear PPE. Be careful with old bottles of highly reactive reagents. Safety training is very valuable. Industry chemist. To this day, I refuse to deal with hydrogenations on my own. In college, the grad student I worked with had us add the starting material, methanol, the hydrogen balloon, and then dry palladium on carbon last. It obviously caught the whey paper on fire in my hand. Luckily, I sat it down and it put itself out and nothing else occurred. However, that incident scared me so badly that now, in my job, my first return to a hydrogenation, I asked advice to all the others around me on how to avoid this, since my reaction currently going needed additional palladium on carbon. One said that I should simply flush the mixture of H2 with nitrogen and then add the solid. As I did so, the solid immediately popped extremely loud and sparked, but luckily no flames occurred. These two incidences made me always add palladium on carbon as a solution in methanol and hand the reaction off to our bomb reactor chemist, so no hydrogen gas was necessary on my end. Such a minor reaction still gives me anxiety to this day. I have also had this specific thing happen with methanol before, and the solution that I have is quite easy. Use ethanol. I haven't had it happen with ethanol yet. If you have had it happen with ethanol though, please leave a comment down below so that we can make sure that people are able to avoid dangerous reactions in the future. Because palladium on carbon is such a good catalyst, if there's a little bit of oxygen and methanol vapor, it can auto ignite. So you don't need a spark. All you need is a catalyst and palladium on carbon is a damn good catalyst. I just remembered I have a fun chemistry story. So I'm in grade seven and my small private school is doing a science fair. Dry ice was a popular ingredient in science fair projects, as it makes cool vapors. Now, one of the students in the grade 8 class was using dry ice to make bubbles with soap and warm water. The issue started when lunch came around, and he started messing around with the dry ice in more explosive ways. By adding a chunk of dry ice to a plastic bottle, pouring in hot water, and quickly sealing it, you get a grenade. Several bottles were filled and then thrown, exploding several seconds afterwards. Then, this guy filled one of those small yogurt bottles with dry ice and hot water. He threw it, it hit the ground, and nothing. Everyone watching, including myself, waited for about 10 seconds as it just sat there. Then, he walked towards this bottle and picks it up. That agitation was enough to get the pressurized bottle to go boom. So did his hand. He ran to the bathroom, dripping blood, and EMS was called. After about a month or two, he came back into school, with a 5-inch scar running from his wrist to his palm between his thumb and pointer finger. He had broken probably half the bones in his hand, and almost ripped his thumb clean off. Dry ice was promptly banned from science fair projects. Moral of the story, don't play with explosives if you don't have PPE and proper protocols. Just because it looks like a dud doesn't mean it is a dud. It seems like a dud until it isn't. You're the dud if the dud isn't a dud. 
One time, a few years ago, my manager at a large pharma company needed to make a fluorinated final compound. The synthesis involved first synthesizing a volatile fluorinated carboxylic acid, using some Lewis bonded form of HF. I forgot the exact kind, maybe HF pyridine. The procedure that they were following said to isolate the fluorinated compound via vacuum distillation. They cooled the receiving bath in dry ice acetone and proceeded to collect not only their product, but also anhydrous HF, which boils at approximately 20 degrees Celsius. How do I know they collected anhydrous HF? They caught a whiff of the flask while breaking down the setup and said, why does this smell sharp? Bonus points, this manager was our local safety captain. For whatever reason, with HF pyridine specifically, it always has a tendency to off-gas anhydrous HF. I've worked with anhydrous HF. I've worked with HF pyridine quite a lot in my early research, and I always had to work with plastic as a consequence. It's always really scary to work with because HF is really deadly, and most people who think that they're prepared to work with HF are not prepared to work with HF. A friend of mine works in a hospital where they use aqueous peroxyacetic acid, generated in situ for obvious reasons, for sterilizing things. It turns out that they were making up a big batch of it up to 24 hours in advance and just leaving it sitting out and hydrolyzing. Worst of all, the preparation came with some indicator in it to tell you when the active ingredient had decomposed, but no one had read the instructions properly, so they actually were waiting until the cleaning product had degraded before using it. <laughs> this is so stupid, oh my gosh. Uh, it makes me so mad how little chemistry education it would have taken to prevent that sort of thing from happening. Plus getting people to work with a strong oxidizer and lacrimator without any proper PPE. I'd like to thank all of the mouth pipetters who support this channel on Patreon. Your support makes it possible for us to keep producing these educational videos. As a bonus for this episode, I have a story. The story of that chemist. So how did I become that chemist? Well, one day, I was working in a research lab and we had one of our exams coming up for grad school. It was a class on total synthesis and we were preparing for the exam, but while we were preparing for this, I decided to order some pizza to the lab. However, since we were in the lab and I was using Skip the Dishes, which is the same company as Grubhub in the US, I wanted to make sure that they came to the right building. I was working in a chemistry lab, so I made myself named That Chemist. And if you're wondering what kind of pizza I got, it's gotta be steak mushroom melt. That stuff's amazing. Who was I before That Chemist? That's a story for another compilation. Thanks for watching, and I hope you have a great day.